The death of a teenage boy in the back of a police cruiser in 1987 raised many questions then. And decades later, so many of those questions remain unanswered. Michael Taylor's death opened dialogues on race, community relationships, the legal system, and policing. His death also brought about change. WRTV is revisiting this chapter in Indianapolis history, not in an effort to open old wounds, but to learn about the circumstances surrounding Taylor's death and the policy changes his death led us to as a community. We at WRTV believe you can't understand where you are going until you know where you have been. He just asked me if I could just take him home. He said, hey man, I can't go back to juvenile. I can't go back there. When it first happened, people wouldn't believe it. They didn't think it was possible. This police video made it look easy for a man of Taylor's size to shoot himself while handcuffed. For a man to commit suicide, he had a pretty good smile on his face. Oh, hell no. Would you be suicidal about boy school? It ain't exactly the hard rock. You believe he was killed by police? Yes, I do. I joined the investigators in their finding that the fatal wound suffered by Michael Taylor was self-inflicted, be it accidental or deliberate. They gonna kill us all the black boys, all they can. They, it's a conspiracy, y'all know it, I know it. They killed that boy, that's the bottom line. We want truth and justice! We did not know it at the time in 1987, but we were in the early, early stages of the Black Lives Matter movement. We gotta get some answers, and we gotta get them soon. People in Indianapolis said at that time, loud and clear, that Michael Taylor's life mattered. It was a nine-year war from 1987 to 1996, battling to see if he could have some accountability for his life and death. We may never fully exactly understand what happened, and I just think it's best to close this chapter in our history out and move on. When is it over? When will the parents stop grieving? Will the mother ever forget her son? I doubt it. I'm Mark Mullins. I'm here at the Marion County Juvenile Justice Complex in Indianapolis. Over the next half hour, we will be talking about what happened in this parking lot on September 24th, 1987. 16-year-old Michael Taylor was a suspect in a car theft. He was sitting handcuffed in the back of a police car when he was shot in the head. He died the following day. Investigators determined he shot himself. We've talked to Hoosiers who said at the time, and even now, that conclusion is hard to accept, especially in the black community. More than 35 years later, many may have forgotten, but as we still see similar stories continue to make headlines, his story still matters and resonates. We start with this question. How could a teen shoot himself while handcuffed in the back of a police car? Within days, IMPD released a video of police recruits demonstrating how it could be possible for a person wearing handcuffs to shoot themselves in the head. The recruits even wore Taylor's own sneakers to show how a gun could be concealed in them. This despite three officers stating under oath that they searched Taylor and didn't find the weapon. The teen's death ignited concern from the community, leading to a legal battle spanning nearly a decade. No criminal charges were ever filed. In 1996, a Hancock County jury awarded Taylor's mother a multi-million dollar civil judgment, finding the city and the police officers involved failed to protect Taylor. We are revisiting this chapter of Indianapolis history to see what we can still learn from Taylor's death especially now with so much friction between police departments and citizens throughout the country. This journey began with WRTV digital reporter Vic Reichert and digital producer Michael Hartz spending months combing through records, digitizing archive video, and speaking directly with the people involved in this case. Later, they will be joined by longtime WRTV journalist Derek Thomas, who reported on Taylor's death every step of the way. Vic, Mike, this was a very big deal when this happened 35 years ago. Why do you still feel that this is such an important story to still tell today? Mike, we'll start with you. I, I've been digitizing our archive for 
well over five years now and the story kept coming up in some of the videos I was coming up with. So I reached out to Vic to see if he had ever done anything on this story and that's kind of how it began. Yeah, so for me, this started as a you know one story update and quickly grew into this project. And we got new interviews with attorneys, with the jury foreperson, and most importantly, with Michael's mother, Nancy, who told me that Michael's story has never really been told until now. In 1985, of Michael, Marcus, Michelle, and her firstborn, Raylan. And there was a family portrait that I had done of the kids at that time. As you can see, I have a very attractive family. <laughs> I would like for people to know that Michael was a kind and loving young man. I remember when he used to, I, would, I worked two jobs and went to school when I was taking care of when Michael was living. And I would be laying on the bed and he would come home and he would rub my feet. He was, um, he was just a kind, he, all, he, was, he was always out for the underdog. Most things that happened to Michael in school when he got in trouble, he was taken up for someone. When he saw people picking on somebody, he would go and defend them. I just talked to his girlfriend from the time he was 12 to 16. Her name was Christine. And she was telling me how they met. Some boy, a man was manhandling her, and he went to defend her. And after he defended her, he didn't even know her. She lived next door to his grandmother. He went to talk to her. Well, she was a very pretty girl. I'm sure she still is. He asked her to be his girlfriend. <laughs> so, okay, he had other motives. <laughs> but that's just the kind of person he was. You know, he cared about others. He had a kind heart. He was a very good artist. He danced. During that time, you know, they did break dancing and I would take the kids to the nursing home with me where I worked and Michael would go and dance for the people at the nursing home. He had a personality, he had family, he had passions. He wasn't just a suspect that was killed in the back of a police car. Police say gunpowder residue was found on the victim's hands, but at least a little was found on a policeman's hands too. The news was on. And I just heard from the other room that someone had been shot at the juvenile center. And I got up and went to the television. And I didn't know it was Michael. But when I heard it, I fell to my knees. I got a call from the chaplain, from the police department. That's when I found out. And from there, I can't tell you what happened. I believe the Lord carried me from there on because only God could have gotten me through that. I don't want any violence. I just, I just want justice. I felt like I was in a capsule being protected from the things that were going on. I felt like I had to be strong for everybody because I saw some of the things that were being said from family and friends because they were angry. Why can't they check it out like it was one of theirs? So I tried to keep a positive outlook and through that, I'm here today. Did you ever for a minute think that Michael might have committed suicide? No, 
When you hear something enough, you do think back and say, well, you know, teenagers. But I saw no reason that he would have done that. Like I said, he had a support system. He had people that loved him. People said that he said he wasn't going to go back to boy school again. He may have said that. But he may have said that because he wasn't planning on going to jail. That doesn't mean he was going to kill himself. You're just assuming that's what he thought. You want, Nobody's a mind reader. We can take a, a statement and make it be whatever we want it to be. Nobody knows the truth. Michael didn't steal a car when he was arrested. He was looking in cars. He was a suspect. So all these years, people think, oh, he was a car thief. Oh, he did this. He No, he wasn't a hero. He was a 16-year-old young man that was doing a lot less than a lot of 16-year-olds at that time. But it was wrong. I'm not saying it was right, but it wasn't a death sentence. They had a responsibility to Michael's safety, and they did not do it. Where would Michael be today? He made a mistake at 16. They made mistakes. I've made mistakes. We all have done things when we were immature. But as we mature and with the right guidance, we don't know where we'll be or where any of these young men and women today that are making poor decisions will be but they need an advocate. I'm not saying he was perfect, but I'm saying Michael, the person that I knew and loved, was a very kind person. A mother still with so many questions, but one she says only God will be able to answer. But she did finally receive one answer during the civil trial nearly nine years after her son's death. We'll hear from some of the key players involved, including a member of the jury, when WRTV presents The Michael Taylor Story Returns. Michael Taylor died in 1987. Nearly nine years later, the case finally went to a jury, not in criminal court, but a civil trial with millions of dollars on the line. 16-year-old Michael Taylor. 16-year-old Michael Taylor. Michael Taylor, according to the black community. The Michael Taylor incident. From the Michael Taylor task force. Michael Taylor intentionally killed himself. This was kind of the story and the trial of that uh, era. The parties were just diametrically opposed in terms of what they believed happened. He committed suicide. Police officers didn't do anything wrong. You believe he was killed by police? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Truth is stranger than fiction. These officers just don't have it in them. I thought the police officers were professional and um, would not have done anything intentionally to harm this kid. Marianne Oldham and John Kautzman never believed Indianapolis police officers were responsible for killing Michael Taylor. Peniston in particular, since he was in the, you know, driving the car, he didn't draw his weapon. Again, it gets back to it's it's not in his nature. This was just a police officer that had picked up a juvenile arrest and was driving him down to 25th and Keystone to the juvenile center. Why he would be so incensed as he would try to assassinate some kid makes no sense to me. The attorneys represented the city of Indianapolis and the officers named in a civil suit. They argued the shooting that ended the 16-year-old's life was self-inflicted. It's the same conclusion reached in every official investigation into Taylor's death, including that of the FBI. But despite the findings of several investigating agencies, for some, Taylor's death was still difficult to comprehend. Our theory was he was either trying to commit suicide or was trying to pull it up so he had a shot toward the police officer's back of his head, and we never um, really pinned down on which of those things that he did. Michael's mother, Nancy, 
was also searching for answers. We didn't know anything. We didn't know what happened from the time Michael was arrested to the time he died. That's the only way we could get any information. To get that information, Nancy Taylor filed a wrongful death civil suit in Marion County in 1989. The case was eventually moved to Hancock County and went to trial in February of 1996. On March 21st of that year, the six-person jury rejected the belief that Michael Taylor shot himself. The Taylor family was awarded $4.3 million in damages. Oldham and Kautzman were stunned. At this point, I don't think we have any reaction other than uh, uh, shock, and I think we're just going to have to regroup at this point and decide where we go from here with an appeal. I don't think the evidence supports the verdict. Tomorrow morning, as soon as I get out of bed, we're working on the appeal. At most, they were negligent for failure to do a good search, but not for killing him, which is kind of what the jury verdict came out as. I do think he was shot, not by his own hand. Bonnie Andrews was the four person on that jury. We're not showing her face at her request for privacy, but she agreed to talk to us about her experience. She says she never believed the argument that Michael Taylor took his own life. I don't know how else to say it, but I think he was murdered. However, this was a civil trial, not a criminal one. Multiple investigations found no credible evidence to support a criminal trial. But despite this, Andrew says she was not alone in her conclusion that Michael Taylor didn't kill himself. Five of us immediately said that we should find in favor of the family. Only one person kind of said, no, police officers are all good and can't be bad. We can't forget the, um, the time that we were living in. The country was still grappling with the police beating of Rodney King. And just a few months before the trial began in Hancock County, jurors in California acquitted O.J. Simpson. All of a sudden, this whole um, uh, specter of police versus citizen, black versus white, was hitting a rural Indiana county for the first time. And uh, I'm sure the jury had to be cognizant of that when they looked at the evidence. Race was obviously um, not something that we tried the case over but was the elephant in the room that everybody recognized. Common sense just told us that it just didn't work the way they were trying to present it. It just didn't work. Even after the verdict, legal battles continued. The appeal process would ultimately reduce damages to about $2 million four years later. It wasn't a lottery. It wasn't something I could be happy about. My son was dead. According to Oldham, the weight of the jury's finding also hung heavy on the shoulders of the officers involved. They felt like they were accused of something they didn't do. So I think they carried that. WRTV spoke with the officers named in the civil suit. They declined to comment. Today, things are different. Michael Taylor's death prompted change within the Indianapolis Police Department. There was enough concern in the police department to make sure tragedies like that don't happen again and to craft rules designed to do that. Officers are now equipped with body cameras. The fact that things are being videotaped is a positive move because it's going to show, hopefully, depending on the angle, there's all kinds of camera things, but show what actually happened so it can be dealt with quickly and resolved and not linger. The lingering question of what happened to Michael Taylor in the back of an Indianapolis police car in September 1987 will likely never have a clear answer for anyone, including Michael Taylor's mother. There's some things we'll never know. And I had to accept the fact that God knew and I was okay with that. The Michael Taylor story made Indianapolis headlines for years, and a former WRTV reporter who was there for every development sits down with Mike and Vic to share his unique perspective. People in Indianapolis said at that time, loud and clear, that Michael Taylor's life mattered.
Hi, I'm Vic Reichert uh, with WRTV. I'm here with Michael Hart and Derek Thomas, a, uh, an alumni at WRTV. And we're, we're so excited to have him because uh, Michael and I have been working on a project about Michael Taylor, a case that um, really rocked this city. And Derek was somebody who was here at the time, who was a reporter for WRTV and who covered that story. We did not know it at the time in 1987 but we were in the early, early stages of the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, people in Indianapolis said at that time, loud and clear, that Michael Taylor's life mattered. We want truth and justice! That's what it all boils down to in the minds of these people who came today to show support of Michael Taylor's mother, family, and their entire community. We gotta get some answers, and we gotta get them soon. It was a nine-year war from 1987 to 1996, battling to see if he could get, have some accountability for his life and death. A 16-year-old boy being shot in the back of a police car is just, uh, it's baffling. The police department did a pretty good job trying to demonstrate. They had a live television uh, demonstration of how it could possibly happen. Police Chief Paul Anae wanted an uninterrupted audience with ministers and black community leaders, and he got it. For an hour and 45 minutes, Anae and investigators displayed photographs, drawings, and videotaped experiments, all proving to the department Michael Taylor's death was suicide. There had never been, to my knowledge, a live police demonstration on TV in the middle of the day and they had police recruits who had went through this process you know, uh, with their hands handcuffed behind their backs and they were able to successfully demonstrate that this was possible. But for the most part, the community, the black community, still didn't buy it. That was a big cover up. Uh, if you notice in the picture, the seat of the police car, the guy in the back could have turned the flip that seat was up so far. I don't even trust the handcuffs that they had on him because they normally put handcuffs on a man and it hurt him. A guy want to cry when, when he's handcuffed. Being a cynical news reporter, mm -hmm. I had been in criminal situations and observed evidence. Uh, so when the police uh, presented this, you know, I was probably more open to the possibility that this happened uh, than the community who mistrusted, feared, uh, was suspicious of police all the time. One thing that inflamed the community was uh, the one day suspension. Five members of the Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance watched the police department version of what happened at Mount Olive Baptist Church. All along, the ministers in this group that represents up to 80,000 parishioners has said there were too many questions and not enough answers. Now they are upset with the proposed punishment for the officers involved. The arresting officer and the officer who transported Michael Taylor received a one-day suspension. That one-day suspension, I think, inflamed the community even more. I think it would have been better if they hadn't been suspended at all. But the one-day suspension was uh, tough to take. And if you go through the old video, you would hear people saying that. Uh, the fact that a, a life was lost would suggest to anyone, with, really with common sense, that someone should be fired. I hope in uh, my 68th year on Earth that uh, there has been progress. Uh, and uh, during the course of my uh, 40 years of working here, uh, I was able to see uh, changes, uh, transitions uh, in relations with uh, the police community, uh, and it was better. Indianapolis uh, was and is a uh, fairly nice place to be you know, for a black American. What happens though is if you are poor and black and live in a community where there's a lot of crime, and then you, you have problems, there are issues in being able to negotiate that 
uh, in an easy way. It's tough being poor and black <laughs> in any place in America, and Indianapolis is no excep exception to that. Derek, do you, do you think the Michael Taylor case still matters today? Certainly. It, it, it matters for that family. It matters. Uh, I'm a big believer in history. I mean, hopefully we have learned something from Michael Taylor. You know, I think it's a, a, uh, a continual learning process uh, that we won't do the things, the things the same way we did back then. Each generation moves for, forward. It progresses. Uh, we, we have cameras, uh, police have cameras right now, and they could, they could have captured that uh, video, what happened there that day. Uh, uh, we do a better job, hopefully, of searching uh, criminal suspects so they can't uh, squirrel away a gun in their shoe. Uh, so hopefully we have learned, and we won't make that mistake again. 35 years later, there isn't anything anyone can do about Michael Taylor's death, but there is a way to remember him and his story. We can remember his name, what happened, and through our collective efforts as a community, strive to keep improving. There is much more compelling information and interviews on this story on our website at WRTV.com. You can also stream this special on services like Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire TV. I'm Mark Mullins with Vic Reichert and Michael Hartz. Thanks for joining us for this special. WRTV presents the Michael Taylor story.